Hey there, dealers. I'm Jonathan M. Pruitt, and this is my attorney, Jim Davis. Once you get locked into a serious D&D session, the tendency is to push fear as far as you can. Now we can't stop here. This is Doombat Country. You bought the ticket. Now take the ride. This is Fear and Madness in WebDM. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Their library of content is perfect for recharging your imagination, those DM batteries. Oh, definitely. When I started inhaling the Dresden Files, I got on Audible, I got the first book, Stormfront, and it was a trade-off between the book and listening to it in the car, and I tore through that series in no time. Audible has the largest content library out there, and so that means that there are tons of selections, fiction, non-fiction, fantasy, science fiction, all designed to just help you uh, get a grip on fantasy and inspire you, and uh, hopefully find something for your Dungeons & Dragons games. So start listening with a 30-day Audible trial, and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash webdm, or text webdm to 500-500. All right, Jim. There is nothing to fear but fear itself. And the spell cause fear, and then that monster that can do that fear thing. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, and then that, that paladin that, that can do that fear. So there's a lot there's of things lot to of fear. Things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So let's start with fear. Let's start with fear. And to you, what is the most important part of trying to relay fear to your players and try to really instill fear, like whether it's player or PC, you know? Answering that question of like who. Who do I want the ob who or what do I want the object of, of fear to be like? Is it a desire for the players to feel fear and, and to experience apprehension and dread about the events of the game? And, and I know there are some DMs where they want that. They want the players to be afraid um, yeah. uh, for something. Or is it just the characters, right? Like, are you just trying to impose, like, say, mechanical conditions or, mm -hmm. or something like that on the characters? And maybe you ask for a bit of role play to go along with it, or the player does just you know for fun. A player character is afraid of water, or afraid of cats, or afraid yeah, of yeah, a, yeah. A, a thing, and you present that, and you just you know want to make sure they at least role play it, right? In a lot of ways, this is a. Uh, sometimes you you get a mismatch between what the DM expects and what the players expect. In that, I, I do really get the sense from some DMs where they they want the players to experience a certain type of fear because they think it will help them maybe get into character better or, mm -hmm. or like, like really immerse themselves in this kind of like horror environment. But in, in my opinion, that really leads to a lot of like risk aversion in the player's yeah. part and like it crosses that line from like what is strictly in the game to what's not. And while immersion might be very important and really getting into character might be a good reason to play the game, like not to the point where you're afraid of doing something, like afraid of playing the game. Because now you've like instilled like a meta existential fear yes. where it's just you scared for this thing because you don't want to go through the whole process. You don't want anything to happen yep. to your character. Yes. But that's not like what the situation should call for. It's not the same as like being afraid for your life or afraid for a, a thing. Yeah. This is a, a case where maybe maybe Dungeon Masters just need to accept the fact that they're not going to get that same kind of immersion that they're maybe looking for. And that instead what, what they should be aiming for is like establishing a consistent tone and theme for their game. And mm -hmm. so if fear is going to be a big part of it. Uh, and, and even other types. We're not just talking about fear in this, in this episode. We're talking about madness and, and other sorts of like what we might call, for the purpose of the video, negative mental conditions. Yeah. You know, they're, they're states of mind that you, you know, they're imposed on your character, they limit the options that your character has. But for certain types of gaming, say like dark fantasy or survival horror or something, mm -hmm. they're like an essential component yeah. of it. Using your players' fears against them, making your players afraid, there's a fine line there. You can do it. Sometimes it might be so, you know, something like, oh, you know, how you guys feel about body horror or uh, giant insects. You know, th things that in the real world people might be like, I'm really squeamish about seeing blood and viscera and things like that. Or I, I don't really care for this, you know, for bees or mm -hmm. rats or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't mind blood and viscera, Jim, but only on Tuesdays. Right. <laughs> so you might like use those with their foreknowledge ahead of time just be like, hey, I'm, I'm curious as to what things sort of like squick you out yeah. because I am looking to provoke a response in you as well as provide something exciting for your character to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay, but maybe not the whole like cultivating a type of risk aversion in the player because it's like, 
they're too scared to act. Yeah, you know? and and also I think it's 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 good to uh, even if you want to try to instill this fear, make, like make sure that your all your players are on board for that. Oh, like, certainly, you might have players that don't actually like that. Yes, and yeah. that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you could, there's ways to present situations that where it can affect some people but not others. When it comes to trying to instill this fear, what do you prefer to use? Because there's different ways you can do this. I mean, there's spells, there's creatures, there's different kind of mechanics and conditions, oh, yeah. but like, how do you think about it? So I think there does need to be some mechanical weight to it. And and I do think like, say, having a frightened or, or afraid condition or something like that uh, is a good component of an RPG, especially if you're wanting to incorporate supernatural fear or fear that is of a magical nature that like takes over a person mm -hmm. uh, or something like that. So in that sense, the, the mechanics for fear that you can find in fifth edition, most of it hinges around the frightened condition, which imposes uh, disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks, and it has a, a, a writer that says, yeah, you, you can't move closer to the source of your fear. You yeah. can move, you can still do things, but you, know, you can't really uh, you know, move any closer to it. And then, I mean, but that also means you can sit there toe-to-toe -to -toe with the thing that's frightening you and still attack, just not sure. as well. Yeah, just not as well, or you can use ranged attacks against it. Um, that's, that's for just the basic condition. And so something like Cause Fear, a first-level spell, uh, is, it just imposes that condition, and then the, the, uh, you know, the victim gets a, a saving throw at the, end of, of every, uh, at the end of their turn. Whereas, like, say, Fear is a big AoE spell. It targets uh, you know, multiple targets. It, carries the rider that like you have to use your dash action to run away you, you, that potentially provokes further attacks and yeah, and could easily, attacks all around. easily get messy yeah. and so like fear is one of those nasty spells or abilities that you can use on say melee fighters after they've already run a gauntlet and then make them run it again and then to get back to you mm -hmm. uh, would have to do it a second time or a third um, so that's certain ways that you can use it from a mechanical perspective uh, and that's really just like the condition Cause fear and fear are the two. Like one of them's an enchantment, one of them's a necromancy spell, maybe, or illusion might be fear. I'm not sure uh, off the top of my head right now. Others would be phantasmal killer, mm. right? That's a uh, a spell that sort of like conjure up an image in you know the the target's mind of their worst fear, and then it uh, and then of course comes with some other stuff. Um, weird is the mass version of that, and then there's like really esoteric high level spells that you don't see very often, like eye bite or antipathy that have fear in them and have fear as a component of them but really i mean like how, when was the last time you saw these spells used <laughs> you know in in a game where you had to like worry about it or that you didn't already have like immunity or heavy resistances to fear because it's high level D D and you probably have acquired something like that because mm -hmm. you don't want to run away from the fights all the time. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember seeing someone cast Eye Bite once and I don't think it really worked. Yeah, it's one of those multi-purpose spells that comes with a lot of different functions and one of them is like causing a target to be afraid. It's like neat in theory because it's like evil eye and, and yeah. you know, hexes and curses. The spells that impose fear are one thing, but I, I like the condition fear at least. But I think my favorite way of portraying fear and phobias, whether it's short term or, or not, is to just say you have a new flaw, right? Like you have this new flaw, whether temporarily, it frames it differently, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the frightened condition is a mechanical artifact that can be negated through advantage, through having allies that kind of like can position you around the battlefield, right? In other words, willingly move closer so you could, you know, be unwillingly moved closer. Uh, it can be, you know, a lot of these effects can be taken, uh, you know, taken down with the spell magic uh, mm -hmm. for those, something like that, where it's like, oh, you're under the effects of a magic spell? Here you go, now you're fine. Instead of having that saying like, yeah, you just have a new flaw, you know, role play it when you can. If you role play it and it, it's particularly inspiring, get, in, get inspiration for it. Yeah. But it's a different way of interfacing with the mechanics of the game that can still produce some fairly satisfying results, especially if you have players who are like super into role playing it and get into it and, and enjoy having that, uh, that challenge with them. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it does seem like there are two, two camps here where it's either like you role play just the condition frightened and it's detrimental to your mechanics mm. or you give yourself a new flaw and it's detrimental to your RP and maybe your interactions, Good, sure, yeah. but it leads to greater mechanical benefit. Yeah. And so, I mean, like, I like that because it incentivizes the players to yeah. really play those flaws and, and those things that, that make them scared. Like, right. they don't like 
bare blades, no matter yeah, what. So, yeah. you know, they have an insanely long beard and they've never had a haircut. Yeah, it could be something that's like, you know, it begins as a, a cultural taboo or something like that that turns into sort of a low-grade phobia. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, well, it started, I needed to do this thing, you know, for my magic. And now that I've avoided it for so long, it's it's a terrifying thing or it's a you know, weird hang-up I have. One of the things that, that, like, all of this touches on is that, you know, you're, you're putting a lot on the player to kind of, like, behave in ways that are not in their best interest as a player yep. right and and that's a tough ask for for a great many players that they just either can't do it they don't want to do it um you know for them doing something that's like detrimental to their character willingly or, or voluntarily is against the spirit of the game mm -hmm. um but i've always loved games where you're you can be forced to act against your character's interests yeah like those those are uh, really fun mechanics some people uh rpgs are just escapism for them yes. so in the real world that's they're kept down and they can't you know, function at their highest, and so yeah. when they go into their games, they're, that's what they're there for. Yes, is to yeah. be badass and be whatever. And the thought of like not being that cool, or not doing yeah. the insanely cool thing, yes. or you know, running away from the big fight as opposed to, oh, this is my moment. Yeah. Yet again for this week, you know, you right, have your sure, moment sure, every yeah. week. Every week, and, and it's moment, like, no, yeah. no, no, this is the moment where you fail. Yeah. And yeah, that's the one long, you right. get to talk about like, you know, that that then becomes your your Peter Parker Uncle Ben moment where you, that gives you guilt and like can yeah. make make a more interesting arc for your character in the long run. Absolutely. And especially if you're in and you know, you're playing in a very character driven type of game where it's the it's the characters' agendas that drive play, yeah. it's the interaction between them that provides a lot of the tension and the exciting portions of the game then having mechanics in place that say like, yeah, you don't all, sometimes you're going to do things that rub your <clears throat> fellow party members the wrong way, or you're going to do things that are not in your best interest, but the stress and trauma of doing, of living this adventuring life prevents you from acting the way you want, or right. consequences of, of facing off against these horrific evils have, have just taken a, 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 taken their toll on you. And so asking the, asking the player to like, oh, you know, run away in a fight. Uh, don't, you know, hesitate. Don't immediately, uh, um, you know, attack. Those are things that might be interesting from a character perspective, but might be breaking the social contract of your group, right? Like if you've got a group that's heavily into like tactically optimized combat and, and really, you know, really appreciates the, the nitty gritty of that, then they might not appreciate having one of their team members, that player making the decision to make a less than optimal choice mm -hmm. because of some role playing, if there's not a mechanical um, sort of effect going yeah, on. Yeah, the guy who wants to play the barbarian who's afraid of combat, who always goes into combat but doesn't attack until he's hit first. Sure. So yeah. he often gives up his first act round of uh -huh. actions. Yeah. They hit him, then he goes into a rage and wipes the floor. Right. And then but some people would actually be mad. Yeah. Like, why do you waste your first action every round? It's like, well, because this is what my guy does. There are some people who would see that's the equivalent of I'm just playing my character, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so this is why, like, you presumably are doing all this after you've had a nice long adult talk with the players in your party, figuring yeah. out what they expect from behavior of both themselves and you and their fellow players and also establishing a consistent tone and theme for the game because maybe you are playing heroes and heroes don't hesitate or when they do it's it's the result of some sort of like internal mm -hmm. strife. I personally don't care for that level of play. I, I like playing regular desperate people who are brushing up against the supernatural and having to uh, you know outwit it and survive it. Um, but you know that's just one flavor of many for this, uh, this yeah. game. See now I want to make a character that does that. Yeah. Who's yeah. afraid of the power he wields. Uh -huh. So he's giving the, I give you this one chance yeah. to, to put your blade down. And they always <laughs> walk right up to him and just, uh, you've made your choice. Oh, sure. Yeah, you yeah. Know. And then afterwards, he deals with the consequences uh, of violence. I mean, like, this is a, an interesting topic of it because D&D, &D, yeah, especially kind of like treats its violence very casually. It's heroic. It's bloodless in a lot of cases. Okay. The, the only blood is really the uh, like the stain in the shirt right around the arrow. You know, yeah. it's just like a ring. Yeah, I know a lot of people don't play that way, and there have been plenty of gruesome and bloody versions of RPGs, including D and D, uh, out there. But it seems like now we're in a moment where heroic play, play that's about the interactions between characters and the like, or or facing off against unique monsters and sort mm -hmm. of overcoming them. It's a bit different than the like gritty survival resource management of, a, say, a, an old school dungeon crawl, right. where you know you just have different play priorities. I mean, other than D and D, 
Yeah. There's other RPGs that have like versions of maybe not fear, but like uh, some like uh, like Octon Cthulhu used stress uh -huh. yeah. for like mental uh, that yeah. you could then get mental conditions, but it was the stress on you. Like the we recently played a the, the new Alien RPG. The new Alien RPG. Has and they had a like fun that, mechanic yeah. where you add, add dice to your pool. Yes. Because you know. The adrenaline pumping through you. You know, you, 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 you know, just... Now that I think about it, that's really a good mechanic, right? Like, so yeah. the more stressed out you get, and there's all these events that have caused stress, it's a meter that builds up, but it's a dice pool system, so mm -hmm. the more stress you have, you add that many points to your you pool. You keep adding another die to your pool. Right. You don't want to roll, like, uh, doubles or triple ones or whatever. Yeah, but... Because that's your, that's your critical fail, and so that's more of an opportunity to do that, yes. and then you just... Waste a whole clip, and then or you just do it. Yeah, you you know, you empty a whole clip. You you do things that that you wouldn't otherwise do as a player because you'd have to like enforce those behaviors as like a DM or something like that. Whereas this one, the the the, yeah. the game does it for you and says like, all right, there are situations in which you're going to be stressed out. Take a stress, roll mm -hmm. those in your dice pool. But if any of those stress dice come up. You know, fumble. These special things happen. And like right. I say, you might freeze. You might do nothing. You might babble incoherently. You might cry, run away. You might weep. You know, empty your clip or something like that. You might do something that hurts another person. There's an even one where it's like you're okay personally, but everyone else around you starts freaking out because they see you kind of have a start to have a freak out. Oh, yeah. So there, it, it can cascade as well. <laughs> and that's an interesting thing to think about, like having multiple layers of fear or stress. Yeah. Because uh, you saying that, like uh, in like XCOM, the strategy game, uh -huh. the same thing. Like if somebody starts to lose it, then the lesser experienced members of your group will be like, oh shit, well they're they're freaking out. Well, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, and then they yeah. can't act. And then and, they can't act. Yeah. Um, but I think that that that's an interesting way to um, uh, think about fear in a, in a in a role playing game. But like, take like the confusion, like yeah. spell. Yeah. And like, kind of port that over and use some different aspects of that, like the sure. acting randomly or running away or yeah. just freezing or just attacking something random. Yeah, you know, yeah. like those can also be fear reactions. It's important in that sense to also like think about the types of fear that you're um, that you're dealing with there. Right? There's blind terror, which might be brought on by a dragon attack, and you're just overwhelmed by the dragon's supernatural presence and the fact that it's so big and mm -hmm. you're so helpless that I I even that yeah you might even like role play that as just like you guys black out like okay <laughs> sometime later <laughs> you literally like sheep just yeah. fall over because that's the best thing to do right now yeah but I, I do miss uh, do miss the old dragon fear like the yeah. automatic the second you see a dragon yeah I, I think the range is fairly limited yeah, in the edition yeah it's pretty limited now that's what that's the thing it's like oh I'm gonna stay like 80 feet away because I think it's 60 feet or is it, it sounds right uh, I mean yeah, it's it's, I'm sorry if that, 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 that number is wrong but used to like if I'm remembering correctly it was like the second yeah, you, you see a it, dragon yeah. Make a save, or you just start crawling yeah. under a bed and pissing yourself. Yeah, you start trying to trying to get away from this giant creature. And I think like the frightening aura uh, and the like of dragons could easily be ported to other like bigger t creatures, where it's just like seeing this thing is enough to make you, you know, freak out. You know, mm -hmm. why isn't the kraken produce something similar? Like you're a sailor. You know, in a crow's nest, and you look down, and there's a beast swimming barely underneath the surface that's three times the size as your ship. I think that those are appropriate cases for like having the rules intervene and go like, no, please make me a wisdom save or charisma save or whatever it is, and you know, to, to keep your shit together, to keep your cool, yeah. so you don't lose it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah that's so the, the cult, that's actually the cult <laughs> mechanic is uh, is uh, keep it together. Keep it together. There's all kinds. Unknown armies has a stress mechanic of any time you get into sort of like combat or violence mm -hmm. that builds up. There, there's a lot of RPGs that have this thing that that keeps the tension and the stress that's there. Um, but not always, right? Like there's horror RPGs that I can think of, like say Vampire, where it took me a long time to realize like, where's the horror here? Yeah. Like what exactly is it that's horrific about this? And it's more the themes and things that you're playing with. And, and you've got a humanity score that kind of, or at least you did, I'm not sure about fifth edition Vampire, but uh, you know, you have a humanity score that kind of like determines how in touch with your old life you were and how, how you know, not a bestial vampire you are, but that's more of like a gauge, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really seems like it's more about like to get that horror for vampire, it's a play style thing and how you approach yeah, yeah. these uh, questions of your character, what yeah, they become. Yeah, in cult there's, um, 
when when you see some crazy shit or you have to do some stuff or if you're a normal person you see somebody die like you yeah. know, same thing in like uh, uh, Call of Cthulhu um, but that's more insanity madness and we'll get to that in a minute yeah. but uh, it, ha- it does have a track like when you don't keep it together you start going down this track where yeah. you start getting frazzled and I mean I, I can't remember the exact terms for yeah, it but, there's like but gradients but there's, yeah yeah uh, there's a grade to it, and you know it's it's little things where it's like minus one to these active roles, minus one to passive roles, and yeah. it's a minus two to the you know, and it it, it builds. It's and, more like granular, and slowly it just gets harder to do everything, <laughs> and you know, including keep it together. Oh, certainly, which, right. you know, then it snowballs. Then it snowballs, um, yeah. And, and I think that that's one thing about say fifth edition D anD D that that there's rarely situations where things are going to death spiral and sort of like snowball uh, against you, it, but, it, unless it's, unless you're talking about exhaustion. Exhaustion can do that. Fear, yeah, 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 definitely exhaustion can do. That. So maybe that's what it is that you use to make them afraid. <laughs> Making the rest rules a little bit different, so it's a little oh, bit harder sure to get right. away from get get rid of that exhaustion, and then you bring in start messing with them while they're sure. while they're tired and not thinking straight, and yeah. you know, and have a time crunch going on in them. So uh-huh. it's like that's how you can sort of use it in in in, in one way. Uh, some other types of fear that I'm thinking of are just like sort of creeping dread. Uh, the yeah. the 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 slow buildup of something that you either can't defeat or is unknowable, of like fear of the unknown, um, things like that, and and it's difficult to pull off because like the essence of a video game is is saying, or sorry, not a video game, but a essence of a an RPG is like information flow, codifying certain things that might otherwise be mysterious and unknowable, like say the inner workings of magic, because you need to have a game that can be played, but it also robs it of some of that mystery and and secrecy which is you know the foundation for um, for like fear and horror right yeah well in the absence of information <laughs> we will fill in the gaps with our worst nightmares well that's, so that's yeah that's a tool to use i mean in your favor well i mean it's 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 one way to like i mean look at the good horror movies like yeah. predator right yeah. you don't show the bad guy yes until abs- you absolutely have to because whatever the players think is out there is Probably worse than what is oh, yeah. actually out there, and yeah, that's the whole thing. Undoubtedly, um, especially if it's just like a like an asshole gnome that's just <laughs> effing with them, and they think it's some crazy monster, and it's just a gnome druid who doesn't right. like people in his forest. He's keeping everybody out. You know, that's, to me, forest. that would be fun. Um, I mean, he does some real like killing joke shit to oh, uh, yeah, yeah, to yeah. <laughs> players, sure. see. Yeah. PCs yeah, that come through his forest. He's a saw druid. Are you sawing the party right now? No. I'm not a hack. <laughs> it's kind of like that movie. Oh, never mind, I'm not going to go into yeah. a Rick and Morty bit. <laughs> so there's a companion to madness, right? Or a companion to fear, which is madness. Yeah, like, well, sort of they go uh, often hand in hand. Yeah. yeah, fear leads to madness. I mean, I'm sure it leads to other things too. But. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and and I, I think that was a good good time to just like remind everybody that, that you know, you're, you're potentially dealing with subjects that might be sensitive to yeah. people at your table. Um, you know, the fear maybe less so than just like different types of madness. Sometimes it might be called insanity uh, or something like that yeah um is is different though because you have the potential to like touch on topics in a way that makes it seem like you're not maybe not taking it seriously or that you're not oh. like in, you know invested in not hurting somebody's feelings and maybe yeah. take it the wrong way it's one of those where if you've talked about it beforehand you said like hey i want this game to feature madness and and, and a lot of the creatures you might be fighting and forces you might be dealing with are unknowable and alien and so like we're going to represent your character struggling with that through some kind of madness uh, mechanic mm-hmm. or, or just commitment to playing a certain way I think is a good way to make sure you head off. It can get out of hand there can be some players that might be a little insensitive to uh, to other players that might know have someone that has like mental illness sure. uh, you know wh- whatever that form may take. Sure. This kind of madness, you've just seen too much. You've seen too when much. When you've seen yeah. too much and you look back at normal life and you, like, looking at normal life is like watching a puppet show. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like people, you nothing matters. Nothing like, matters, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. understanding, I don't know. It's, <laughs> I, my thing is, I love role-playing madness because I play a lot of cult characters, oh, sure. excuse me, Call of Cthulhu characters. Yeah. Three of my Call of Cthulhu characters have gone into permanent, like, Insanity. Yeah. Like, you know, one of one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Koskoff <laughs> did. Uh, my bookseller, uh, Seth Penhaller uh-huh, did. Uh-huh. And my doctor, uh, 
Frank uh, Pierce. That's right. Yes. Uh huh. All three of them. Yeah. Now they were all very interesting versions right. of insanity because they were all just like the bookseller. I mean, he like went into like true cowardice, like mm-hmm. where he would just defer. He, he couldn't deal with anything, and he would just go to the strongest person in the room. Right. And that's and so that's where I just kind of latched on to Delgado, the in, the investment banker. Right. Koskov literally got the kind of madness, which is what he already basically had, where he just didn't fear death or didn't fear any like fear literally. Like was just him. removed from him and that's a detriment to someone who's not already souped up with like superhero level right. powers right but, but Koskoff. for him it just <laughs> eh, kind of worked i always try to be very cognizant of what i'm doing oh sure and let it make sense for the character's arc like to me a good place to start if you are worried about like having uh games which feature madness and and it being taken as uh you know the criticism by someone at the table is to mm-hmm. number one have it flow from the from play, from the shared fiction that you're creating. Yeah. And 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 even to the point where for me, I might not even use real world terms for a lot. This is why we favor say madness as opposed to any, you know, I've, I've seen it sometimes in RPGs, disorders or flaws or, or insanity. And to me, that's a lot of like negative connotations there that I don't necessarily want included in the game. And madness just has a nice generic almost fantasy element to it of you've gone mad, you've seen too much, mm-hmm. you know, they, their mind has been broken. I guess maybe the other thing that I would keep in mind is, as long as we're still sort of on the subject is is to focus on the behavior that's going to be uh, imparted on the character, not so much like a category of, or, or, or who that character is, mm-hmm. you know, but if you instead just say like, no, this is a behavior that they, they are acting on now or an extreme emotional condition that's producing this kind of behavior, Maybe talk about it with the player and say, like, this is the nature of it. Here's what it means for the character. Because also something like with, with madness, less so than, say, fear, which is very often temporary and, and imposed by an external source, uh, a lot of the, the costs to madness are, are internal to the character, right? They're, yeah. they're changes to their personality or the way they should behave. And you're asking the player who's invested, perhaps, in a certain portrayal of a character to change that up. Mm-hmm. And if they're not aware that they might have to do that from the beginning, then that could seriously, like, you know, that might just be like, no, <laughs> you know, this is not what I want for my character. I mean, again, I love that stuff. Yes. Because it's yeah. also something to try, because now you've created new adventures to come back from. Right. Like, oh, I realize that I've seen too much. I've been awful lately, guys. But guess what? There's this place over here. Mm. We got to go through some hell to get there, but there's an <laughs> oasis. We go get a nice cleanse thing, yep. and literally like clean your soul off. Yep. You know, it's it's awesome. It's run by some archons. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's great. Um, it touches right. on the positive energy plane. <laughs> uh, you know, but you can you can have adventures yes. to it deal spurs with it. Yeah. There's downtime activity that can be used for it. There's a lot of games where you accumulate stress or trauma or something and you, you deal with, you manage it uh, through, uh, through downtime. I'm thinking like Blades in the Dark would be good uh, for that. You know, you could take something like that and, and yeah, maybe you're using something um, like the sanity score from chapter nine of the DMG and you've said like, it's so important to me in my game, I want a separate score for it, it's gonna have its own uh, saving throws associated with it, maybe we'll even use different skills with the sanity score. It's worth including these instances of say madness and uh, or insanity because while you're changing something about that's internal to the character, you're also making things more complicated in an interesting way. Yeah. And if that's the theme and tone of the campaign, then I wouldn't worry so much about like changing up the character because I imagine a lot of players are gonna be like you are, where it's like, I want them to be changed. I want to experience this as a player. I'm, I'm similar, yeah. yeah. If there's any kind of table that permanently alters my character, I want to roll on it. Tell me the fastest way to get to roll on that table. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, definitely. <laughs> you know, whether it's a physical mutation or some sort of uh, madness that they uh, that they take on. I'm sorry, but that's so much more interesting <laughs> than just, you know, you adventure and become like a bastion of pure good and a beacon yeah, of hope yeah, and I, all I, this. I, it's I, like, I want to adventure and play and everything, so I get cool stuff that makes me better and get advent- abilities that make me better. Yeah. But I also want to get these, like, whether they're 
whether it's madness or just kind of some quirks or flaws yeah. that make me more well-rounded. Sure. Because that way people look at you and go like, oh yeah, they've, they've been through some stuff. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. And and I can see it being like, not everybody wants to play like a nitty gritty game, not nitty gritty, but like grim dark kind of mm -hmm. where you're dealing with insanity and, and, yeah, and well, sort like of like Warhammer, flawed. Just... Warhammer is a big one. You know, Warhammer, you're just like a regular person who, and, and not just a regular person, if you look at like say the, the career tables of first edition Warhammer, you're like a social misfit, an outcast. Yeah. You know, and, and Warhammer is as much about uh, you know taking advantage of the chaos to climb the social ladder as it is about dealing with said chaos. I love it because it's it, it reinforces the idea of, of this malevolent influence on the mm -hmm. universe that is trying to get you. And so if you experience, say, a critical hit in combat, if you're not, uh, you know, unconscious or something, if you s see something demonic or supernatural, you know, you're going to accumulate insanity points. And that's yeah. what they call them. And, and the, what I liked about Warhammer, particularly the second edition Warhammer, is that they're, once you've reached your break and you fail your test and you, all those insanity points start to count against you, the referee sort of like picks um, insanity that's going to go along with it. They're from an entirely in-setting perspective. They don't really reference any kinds of, you're not going to find terminology from the DSM in here, yeah. right? It, it's all about like the beast within and you fighting off the urges of the blood god within you. Uh, and, and until you finally succumb in an orgy of crimson violence, yeah. you know, it's it, so it, like it avoids the kind of descriptive behaviors that would allow you to easily go this thing in this game corresponds with this thing in the real world, which to be honest, a lot of RPGs have, don't have a great track record with treating the, sen the subject very sensitively. Um, you can avoid a lot of that by just saying like, this is, you know, seer's madness. Mm -hmm. what hap it's what happens to wizards who spend too long looking into the future yeah. and they become obsessed with all the permutations and patterns and signifiers that are out there in the in the copious amounts of noise that mm -hmm. divination produces or uh, you know maybe it's berserker brains <laughs> it comes from yeah. getting knocked upside the head by giant ogres and things too much just gonna just gonna <laughs> let, let that, that just gonna let that yeah, let that go let that <laughs> let that go right by in say like a high fantasy game where you combine the two where like there's a cost to magic and it's in its sanity uh, is one of them your your grip on reality um, like maybe you have a world where there are magicians and the like that are there to reverse those effects and, and like treat them and it's a whole school and thought of medicine. Again, Warhammer has a whole group of priestesses whose job it is is to heal people's minds and bodies um, because chaos is a real thing. It warps people's minds, it warps people's bodies and, and we should show them compassion and not a, you know, a, a flaming uh, torch. Uh. Yeah, that's, those are reserved just for witches and anyone who might resemble a witch. Certainly. Um, but sometimes it can go too far because I remember, yeah. um, I don't remember if it was from uh, actual insanity or if it was a wild magic surge, mm. but I remember Charlie's character in the Warhammer game gained that mental condition oh, of lacking, yeah. object lacking object permanence. permanence. Yeah, that was a wild magic surge, uh, which we, we did our best to kind of work around. But it, it kind of presented unique challenges because it's like losing object permanency is a big deal. At the time, my son was just learning <laughs> object permanency and like you could play peekaboo and we didn't leave the room, we're right there. I had a unique sort of like perspective on it at that time of how vital it is for cognitive development. And then to have a player come and go like, yeah, I, my character like out of sight, literally out of mind. And so we had to just sit down and work through like, what does this mean? How, how much of it, you know, should we let affect your ability to enjoy the game and play it? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, how can, you know, at, at the time, the uh, player was really worried about like reversing it because they thought like, oh, well, you know, this is a game that people watch. I don't want to like just reverse it because it's inconvenient or like lean into it. And so in those instances, just sitting down and talking with the player and going like, here's how we're going to handle it. Here's what I expect from you to portray this. But also like if this ever starts becoming a thing where you're not having fun playing this character, you don't enjoy it, then let's reevaluate. Let's reevaluate and see what we can do. So yeah. that one that one was a challenge. You've had some in Call of Cthulhu that have kind of gone crazy or not well, crazy, I mean, but just sort of like well, they've it, lost all their sand, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've talked about that yeah. with, with with Koskoff and uh, and right. Seth Penhollow, but I was going to go to Alero in Warhammer. Yes, oh yeah. Because yeah. she got an actual like permanent insanity yeah. there because I got enough points. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was though. I know I know I didn't get I didn't get like one of the truly bad ones. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because uh, I know that there there are, there are some, some bad ones. Yeah, but I'm trying sense. to remember what it was. It had to deal with. Um, I think it had to deal with being averse to combat. Oh uh, yeah, because there was already the joke that she was always late for combat anyway. Uh huh. And uh-huh. then I got a, a thing where I'm just kind of like, I don't really like it. Hey, you don't really like it anymore. Yeah, I used to like uh, shy about uh, yeah. about violence. I'm trying to think of like in in Dungeons and Dragons, sort of returning back to fifth edition. You know, Out of the Abyss featured madness quite extensively, and, yeah. and it was sort of a big theme of it. And I, I really liked it because each of the demon princes uh, in there had their own specific madness chart. And so it's like from an in setting, in in world perspective, and so it like the number one that that's right up my alley. <laughs> but also just the fact that it it was e- rather easily incorporated into D and D. It's like here are some of the conditions under which you might roll that wisdom save. Mm-hmm. This is what happens after you fail a certain number of them, getting the uh, long term and then a permanent. But I think there were several players in the party that got permanent or at least indefinite uh, forms of madness, and it it. It made it everything much creepier, <laughs> if I recall. But it was a way to sort of like look at the individual character and find. It was it was fun to find like the patterns in their role play, and mm-hmm. the way in which they've been uh, portraying their character and going like, all right, here is a way that we can take that and make it extreme, make it a form of madness, um, and have mm-hmm. a lot of uh, have a lot of fun with it. And then sometimes it's not even a mechanic. Well, it is because of a mechanic, but it's not a madness mechanic. Uh, we mentioned before with Black Razor. Oh yeah. But how an item can influence a player's behavior. Yeah. And then I started feeling creepy about my own behavior based yeah. off of getting the benefits out of that sword because I basically became a sociopath. Yes. And like realizing like, yeah, this isn't good. And my guy literally would realize I'm not a good guy, mm-hmm. but I'm not this bad of a guy. Sure. And what I've done recently in the name of like exacting revenge, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe I never need to do anything like it again. And yeah. that was that was like a whole big thing. And, and, and to me, like I like that so much more than just you imposing a mechanic on me. Like literally, I had to come to some self-actualization about my character sure. himself. And yeah. I had so much a better time of it. And you know, giving up a legendary like a, I mean, well, no way, it's an artifact. It's an artifact. Yeah, sword. it's an yeah, artifact. Certainly. But like literally, I just gave it up. Yeah. Because it was just like I can't be this person anymore. Can't be this person. Anymore. That takes a certain level of investment on the player's part to yeah. get that. Uh, but it also takes like the dungeon master trusting that the player is going to like get that to sink in. And and you know your players. You know the ones who are not going to think twice about using a cursed sword and all the implications that it has for it because it's got mechanical benefits they don't really care about mm-hmm. the rest and, and for those we've you know that's a problem i think more player engagement and, and mismatch between player and group than anything else yeah um but uh, you know i i think that just sort of maybe my final thoughts on on uh on sanity and madness and all that other kind of stuff is that it should be a way to enhance the game it should be something that like um you know the complications that it has should be fun and interesting and engaging yeah. and further play at the table, not shut it down. Yeah. And so in that sense, you know, you think of the fantasy genre and there's all kinds of places that you can insert these sorts of things. You can say like there's madness as insight, right? Like there's there's a sense in say, I don't know, in the ancient Greek world where madness is seen as having been maybe touched by the gods, having a, a proximity to a reality higher than our own mm-hmm. that induces a form of, of mania. You know, uh, ancient Romans used to call epilepsy Apollo's curse. They, they, that's sort of how they viewed it, was that these things that, that affect you, although, you know, obviously epilepsy isn't an insanity. They sort of like, these things that affect you, they had no explanation for. This was like conditions of the gods, the divine disease or something like that. And so you can be inspired by those and maybe the high priest of whatever religion in your world is just like, you know that, that this priest or priestess will slowly go insane from a mortal contacting, you know, eternal celestial beings for guidance and wisdom. Or the, the spell that was, you know, carved in mammoth bone at the dawn of time that has, you know, you know just grown in potency over all these eons. Like just merely reading it changes your mind. Mm-hmm. It, it, it creates new pathways in your, in your brain, the, the physical matter of it, and, and alters you as you learn it. Uh, you know, contact other plane carries with it the same sort of risk. And there's all kinds of places in fantasy for there to be, like, peoples whose minds have been changed. 
Yeah. And maybe that makes them seem mad or seem insane. But it's really these experiences with other realities in the supernatural that have mm -hmm. uh, made them no longer right for this world. But once you like, uh, like, like, say, like something like an interstellar, like once you peer beyond the uh, event horizon of a black hole and you see the world in a in a four dimensional sure you see yeah, yeah, space, yeah, yeah. you see all of, all of time as one big block. Of yeah, and then stuff, you yeah. have to come back to this, and you're only stuck in this moment. <laughs> yeah, that might seem or or like you know just thinking about uh, Doctor Manhattan, sure, how he yeah. see perceives his own timeline where yeah. it's all simultaneous. Right, right, right. Like, that, and yet like, how often they just get on him about being just an ass, you know, like. <laughs> and he, but, but really, you know, you would be kind of have a malaise because you know exactly what you're going to do and there's nothing you can do to change it. Right, right, right. So why, yeah. would, it, why would any of it matter anymore? Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, why get invested? Why, why would it matter? <laughs> you know, focus on the things that, that uh, you know, that don't remind you constantly that your old way of life is no longer available mm -hmm. uh, to you. I, I really like that for wizards and the like, you know, magic costing them their mind uh, and yeah. contact with all of these other worlds and realities just like messes with them until eventually most sane people just be like, you gotta leave. Like you, you can't stay here anymore. <laughs> you yeah. have to go live in one of those places that broke your brain. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Today's episode was brought to you by Audible. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial and your first audiobook, plus two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash webdm or text webdm to 500-500. Have you joined our huge giveaway yet? We're picking the winners on October 26th. Five ways to enter, link in the comments and description. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons. The Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Yeah, good? Okay, perfect.